It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. These are the final seconds. The lead in the fourth. Can they hold on to it? That do or die time. And everything rides on one shot. But it isn't going to be that easy. And it's a one point game. This is down to the wire. One shot to take you to the top. One win. This is clutch basketball. That's the NBA playoffs. That's game. You are Locked On Wildcats, your daily podcast on the Arizona Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Tuesday, everyone, and thanks for keeping it Locked On Wildcats. I'm your host, Mike Luke, and fortunate enough to be joined by somebody who Well, let's be honest, there's nobody more connected to Arizona basketball over the last 30 years than Steve Rivera. Currently a radio host, he also goes and uh, still writes for uh, All Sports Tucson. Steve, how you doing, my man? Thanks for coming on, buddy. I'm doing well, Mike. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Absolutely. All right, well... One of the real reasons I wanted to have you on was that you covered the heyday of Arizona basketball. You covered what it was like under Lute Olson, and you obviously covered Sean Miller as well. Tell me a little bit about what it was like covering Sean Miller, what your impressions were, and how it is different than when it was covering Lute Olson. Yeah, so when Sean came in, what, late uh, or 2009, I think it was, uh, there was a lot of promise. Uh, you had heard good things from him, from Xavier. Obviously, he was a very uh, consistent success guy at Xavier coming in. Uh, a lot to like. Uh, you didn't know much about him personally, but I don't think that mattered at the time because he was so successful on the court. Uh, so we're looking at uh, maybe uh, the continuation of what was under loot. Um, uh, and, and that kind of happened early in the first couple of years. They went to the Sweet 16, Elite 8. Uh, played Duke, uh, beat them, uh, and then lost to the eventual champion Connecticut. So you're thinking that, hey, maybe he has something here, uh, and uh, Arizona was going to kind of be back or maintain what they had under Luke. Well, um, that kind of happened and didn't happen. They lose to Bucknell, I think it was, in the first round of the NIT, and then they caught fire again, uh, getting to the Sweet 16, and then, of course, their, I think his two best uh, teams uh, in 14-15, I think it was, when he took him to this elite eight and losing to wisconsin so you're thinking in those first five years he said hey arizona struck gold has a good coach uh is is uh coaching his guys up they're playing hard for him and here we go uh compared to to loot uh you can kind of see that it was not going to be a warm and fuzzy feeling from sean uh with the media the locals we didn't have a whole lot of access but we had some um, and Lute uh, was open, open with the media in terms of getting stories. You know, there were times he didn't uh, appreciate the media, but he at least was more open. And maybe the policies were like that at the time, uh, where we had access or more access. And I've said this publicly. Uh, I, in fact, so when Lute was here uh, five years ago, six years ago, I said, thanks for allowing the kids to be adults. You come to college to learn, to experience, and he allowed them to grow up and, and speak to the media. I think one of the reasons why there's so many ex-players uh, talking in the media is because he gave them that ability to speak freely. Now, do you think that how much of that and the difference in kind of being guarded off is a change in landscape in college basketball, but at the same time, Sean Miller being a guy who wanted to be able to control every narrative that he could possibly control? Uh, I think it's more the second part than the first part. Uh, he, let's face facts, Sean is not a uh, out in the public guy. He, he's he's to himself. Uh, if basketball were allowing him to do this 24/7, he would be a, a hermit and and, and kind of just coach basketball. I think that's what his love was, his passion is, and um, and and that's it. I think the fact that it was uh, at a time when we were uh, more closed off. You remember that his AD was Greg Byrne, and and Greg allowed him to do or call the shots with the basketball program. Um, and Arizona didn't need to sell tickets. Uh, who uh, U of A? They don't now need to sell the program. It sold itself. So, and if you win, they're going to show up. So those days, uh, 
he was going to operate how he operated and and uh, what did it matter because tickets were going to sell anyway i think when i think of the the miller era i think of i i, I think of a of a coach that didn't ever really reach his potential and here's what i mean by that when you threw some of the players in the rosters out that he had, you know, where you've got a T.J. McConnell, a Nick Johnson, a Rondé Hollis Jefferson, Brandon Ashley, Aaron Gordon, just going on and on down the list, it always seemed like you have these great athletes and there was just always a reticence to be able to let them go, to be able to mix things up a little bit. And I'll use the Wisconsin games, for example. Now, Granted, you can make the case that, you know, in Arizona history, outside of maybe Devin Davis, Miami of Ohio, I'm sure you were at that game. Um, yes. There hasn't been a performance where you were just more wowed by somebody like Sam Decker. But my issue with all of that, though, Steve, was that, okay, you've got guys that are raining threes left and right. You got to switch things up a little bit. Start, you know, shooting passing lanes. Start picking the defense up half court, full court. There was never that ability to be able to adjust. Whereas with Loot, you always felt that, you know what, he's going to tinker throughout this game. But at the end of the day, these guys are going to be getting out and running and maximizing their potential. And there just never felt like that happened in the Sean Miller era. Well, I think you used a word or phrase uh, to adjust. He he didn't want to adjust because, and I, I wrote this in my column. He he's a stubborn man, and he knows what he knows. Uh, and it's not to say that he's not a great coach or a good coach because he is. He just uh, didn't want to adjust. Um, those teams that you mentioned with those talent, the best teams that he had, without question. Um, uh, my whole thing with him is my whole thing with him is since, since the beginning or, or in the middle is that why wouldn't he let his players play? run have a free flowing uh, thing to it uh there were times when he did and there were many times when he didn't and I, I still say that's not his uh that didn't eventually lead to the demise but i think it was one of the factors in terms of him being more successful he's a structured coach uh half court systems uh pack line defense yada yada but but he had players a lot like Lutz, where Lutz let him play, score in the 80s, outscore the opponents. Defense would struggle from time to time. But guess what? You were going to beat them by 10, sometimes by 20. Steve, I always I always go back to, and this was when um, I was getting into the, you know, uh, I, this was early 90s. And I went to a practice, and this was when they were open. And it was with uh, Khalid Reeves, the Khalid Reeves team, Final Four team. And I'm watching it, and remember how you would always have, it would be like Jesse Evans coaching one team, it'd be maybe Roz or uh, Phil Johnson coaching the other, and Lutz kind of the in the middle right there. And Khalid Reeves, I'll never forget it, for whatever reason, he was running point guard. And he ran the ball to half court, and he looked at Jesse Evans for probably three to five seconds, and Lutz stops the practice. Keep in mind, I'm eight or nine at the time. I'm like, whoa, you know, what's he doing? The Khalid's averaging 25 a game. And he goes over to Khalid Reeves in the middle of practice, and he says... If you have to look over right now at the assistant coach to know what play to run, then I haven't done my job. And it was yeah. just basically the exact opposite of what we've seen with Sean Miller over this last seven or eight years. And I always think of that story there, Steve. No, no question. That's a great uh, point because it's true in terms of uh, Lute. Uh, Lute's philosophy had long been you learn what you need to do uh, in the games on the weekends. And I've said this before. You learn uh, Monday through Friday and you show what you learn on Saturday during the game. And, and Lute did that. You know, he, he just had the ability to, to teach. And we all know this. Um, and I'm not waxing poetic because Lute uh, is, is gone or, or because I, I was a friend of him at the end. Uh, he, he was brilliant at that. And the guys would say that. You worked your butt off from Monday through Friday, and then you showed what you learned. And, uh, and that's what he did. He allowed his guys to play. Uh, there are times, of course, he'd call timeouts and, and instruct them, of course, but – uh, he let them play. Sean didn't, I would say, 80% of the time. This this episode's obviously brought to you by betonline.ag. On the other side, we're going to talk with Steve about what he would look for in the next coach and kind of throw around some possibilities. Thanks for keeping it locked on, Wildcats. This episode is brought to you by ESPN+. Plus. 
Dustin Poirier and Conor the Notorious McGregor will settle the score at UFC 264 on Saturday, July 10th, exclusively on ESPN+. After Conor McGregor defeated Poirier in 2014, Poirier evened the score in January, setting up the most highly anticipated rubber match in UFC history. UFC 264 is exclusively available to ESPN Plus subscribers for $69.99. Or sign up now to get UFC 264 and an ESPN Plus annual plan for $89.98. Visit ESPNPLUS.com slash Spotify. This episode is brought to you by HP+. In a world full of smart devices, shouldn't your printer be smart too? It is with HP+. These printers know when they're running low, so you always get the ink you need delivered right when you need it. Plus, you save up to 50% on ink, so you can print whatever you want, as much as you want, any time you want. Huh, that is pretty smart. Get six free months of instant ink when you choose HP+. Conditions apply. Visit hp.com slash smart for details. Support for this podcast comes from Invent Together. According to studies, less than 13% of all inventors who hold a U.S. patent are women. Black and Hispanic college graduates patent at half the rate of their white counterparts. But we can fix that by increasing participation in innovation and patenting by underrepresented groups... It would quadruple the number of American inventors and increase annual GDP by almost $1 trillion. Invent Together is a coalition of organizations, companies, universities, and concerned citizens committed to ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to invent and patent. Because the more diverse the American patent system gets, the stronger and more successful our nation will become. What can you do to help diverse inventors patent and unleash economic opportunity? Find out at inventtogether.org. Learn more and take action today. Thanks for keeping it locked on, Wildcats. I'm your host, Mike Luke. If you're not consuming a Built Bar, you should be consuming a Built Bar because, honestly, I've been trying to get some gains at the gym, and I can tell you that Built Bar has been a big part of that. I'm going to get Steve Rivera on after this to uh, consume a Built Bar, and I guarantee you that Steve will be hopping on that train as well. If you uh, haven't consumed one yet, you should. They come in lots of different flavors and sizes. Quite good, and like I said, at the end of a workout, there's nothing better than looking for a built bar. Okay, Steve, when you look around the landscape of college basketball, when you take the pulse of this community, what do you, what would athletic director Steve Rivera be looking for in his next potential coach at the University of Arizona? What are some of the checklists that you would want that coach to be able to mark off? Well, uh, I don't think you need to, how do you say, change the whole culture of the program. Uh, I think the, the block A still sells itself. Um, you need to do some, some work. You also have to be a, find a coach who's going to be patient. We don't know what the NCAA sanctions are going to bring, so he's going to have to deal with a year or two or three of trying to rebuild what uh, it used to be. And what it used to be, I mean, in the last – not last five years, but the previous to the five years, because I think there's a difference between Sean's first six and his last six. Um, what would I learn? Oh, man, I think the, the coach has to be affable, uh, available, uh, and, and not 24-7, but more available. Sean was not. Uh, in fact, he was more of a recluse than he was available, uh, but that was who he was. Uh, more available. Um, I think the program itself has to be more available. Uh, and I don't want to say this because, well, I'll say this. Uh, Jed Fish has been perfect in terms of allowing kids to talk. He's been available as much as possible. So he's going to have to do that. And, yes, it, we're in a honeymoon period with Jed Fish. But, hey, why not with the basketball coach? It is the flagship of the U of A athletic department. So I think that's very important. You know, but as a coach, I think he has to be uh, in, obviously knowledgeable Arizona is still one of the best programs in the country. At least it's perceived to be. Uh, it's not one of the best in terms of uh, production, but it can find that right guy. Who would I find or what type of guy? Uh, again, affable, available, um, willing to uh, to listen to the assistants, get input from the assistants. Um, you can't go too far from what you already had, but you can go a little opposite of what you had in Sean. Yeah, and when I think of Arizona basketball, and the one thing that I always think about Lute Olson was that, you know what, I got better players than you. We're going to run faster than you. 
And with the f- few exceptions, you know, uh, in conference play, I think you could make the case that some of those Jim Herrick teams were a little bit maybe more talented. But Lute was going to go into a game, and you know what? We're going to play up tempo, and you know what? We're going to look to run you out of the gym. How many games would you see where, you know, it's tied up 38-38 30, at the half, and then Arizona comes out in that first four minutes in the second half and goes on a 22-4 to four run, something like that. You never really saw that. So I'd like to see a coach that, like you said, is affable, that gets that part of it, but also wants to run Arizona basketball because when I think of vintage, true Arizona basketball, I think of a coach that wants to get up and down the court and make plays and exert their dominance on the other team, not kind of wait for that team to hang around and then hope you can beat them by five or six points. <laughs> well, you're describing Sean's uh, system uh, to a T. Uh, no, no question. And, and I think, let me say this. We, we're going to compare things to loot as it was when you were younger and I was younger. And the heyday and the fun and gun and, and all that run and stun, as I like to call it. He did exactly that. They'd be close early second half. They'd go on a, a patented 17-5 to five run and the game was over. And you're right. They didn't always have the most talent. They just didn't. They were out. They were out coaching the other other guys. They had a chemistry to themselves. They enjoyed playing with each other, and it was a style they enjoyed playing uh, under those conditions. You know, heck, 2001, uh, 97, 98. You can go through a number of 2003, heck, 2005. I think it was when they uh, made that run with uh, in the Sweet 16, uh, Elite Eight. They enjoyed playing, and and Lute um, allowed them to play. Kids today want to do that. Now, Steve, when everybody talks about the alum position and everybody wants an alum, and I think I'm not opposed to that, but I think the issue is when you look around the landscape of professional and college sports with Arizona actors in there, you know, obviously Steve Kerr would be a home run hire, but, you know, I heard the saying a while back that no coach leaves uh, the NBA for the college game unless they are basically forced to leave the NBA. So a guy like Steve Kerr, I don't really believe is an option. Damon is obviously interesting. I will say I never really pegged Damon for being a head coach when he was here, but I know you certainly regard him as the second best player uh, that you've uh, that you've ever covered here at the U of A. What would you uh, What do you think of any of the alumni possibilities, especially being that you've covered these people? Yeah, I think it's all about time and circumstance, and I do agree with you with Steve Kerr. Obviously, he would be the dream hire. He fits all the fits all the boxes or checks all the boxes. Affable, smart, uh, willing to adjust things like that. His style would be perfect here, uh, in terms of spreading the court, things like that. So let's let's eliminate Steve. Let's eliminate uh, Luke for the same same not same reasons, but a lot like that. He's in the NBA. Why would he come back? Uh, do all that. So everyone hoping for that to happen is is a pipe dream type of stuff. Uh, I, I I've endorsed Damon. Uh, I think Damon is ready for this position. Uh, he, Why tell, talk he, about talk about Damon a little bit and just what what makes him ready for that position in your opinion? Well, he, he's a workaholic, and and not that coaches at that level aren't. They have to be. Uh, he's a workaholic. He's attention to detail guy. He went to Pacific, a place where coaches get fired, go to get fired. He's uh, turned that program around from what it was. And people will say, well, he has a losing record. I challenge anybody to go to Pacific and have a winning record in the short amount of time. He's been named the coach of the year in that conference. I think it was last year. Uh, he's won people. It didn't happen by accident. I think he's, uh, He's uh, a well-known enough person to recruit to Arizona to have assistance that will help him and assist him. And he's, and he's uh, not, uh, not a control freak, not a guy who, who, who will take all control and he'll let the assistance help. He's been there, done that. He's been assistants with Josh. He was an assistant for, for Sean. He knows what it takes. Um, and, and, and he's the guy. I mean, if there's an ex-guy, he's my ex-guy. And I've always felt that Damon, and I'm curious as to your comparison on this, when people talk point guard you under Lute Olson, they always, you know, Steve Kerr's generally the first name that's brought up. Damon Stoudemire was always the one that made it sexy, in my opinion, and that kids watch Damon and how quick he was and about how he's pulling up from the cactus and g- getting by his guy. It was almost kind of that West Coast Allen Iverson. I've always felt mm-hmm. that Damon was the one that really kind of made point guard you what it is and kind of transformed it into a national being. 
Yeah, no, I think so too. I don't think in the vernacular that the point guard you had shown up after or shortly after Steve Curry was about the time when Khalid, Khalid, Damon, Reggie, uh, all those guys in that follow with Mike Bibby, Dickerson, Simon, Jason Terry, and, and all these great guards who can, can control tempo and were smart, had basketball IQs, and it carried on Jason Gardner and obviously Gilbert and, and guys like that. Um, so, so no, I don't disagree with you at all. Damon was the centerpiece of that. This was, You're talking 1992, 93, 94, 95. So that's that's 20 some years ago, 30 some years ago. Okay. It's, all right, Steve. So where where we go where we go from here? It's obviously Tuesday morning. What's your gut tell you if, um, as far as timetable, coach? What are you thinking? It's a, I would say by tomorrow, Tuesday, midday, that we'd find out who the guy is. Mm-hmm. Um, who that guy is, I do not know. Uh, there's been names, Ballyhood, of course, obviously. I think that uh, uh, Tommy Tommy Lloyd is, is a big name. I think that's probably where they've been looking at for a long time now. Um, I, I also don't think that this is like a hiring process in the real world. You, you kind of already know who you want before you actually open the position. And I think that has been the name. Uh, obviously, we've all heard a number of times. Uh, if not, maybe Damon. Maybe Damon. Um, I've heard Musselman. Uh, I think that would be a fabulous hire, a fabulous hire. But I thought that maybe sh- that ship may have come and gone three years ago, four years ago when all this stuff broke because uh, his style fits exactly what Arizona used to do under Luke. Yeah, I'm. if there's anybody that's driving the must bus, that's certainly me. I think that he would be an absolute home run hire. But we'll keep you updated here. And, uh, Steve, I can't thank you enough for coming on. And uh, I didn't think there would be any anybody better to be able to talk about U of A past and present than a guy that's been there. Uh, Steve, appreciate you coming on. Love to have you back on in the future. Thank you, Mike. Had a good time. Okay. You've been listening to Locked On Wildcats.